we're thrilled to have Land Commissioner George Press Bush join us today, a native Texan, and the first, and he was first elected to the Texas Land Office as Land Commissioner in 2014, and overwhelmingly re-elected in 2018. He's a Republican candidate for Attorney General, and in his capacity, uh, heading up the General Land Office, uh, he works on a host of issues. Led the state's housing recovery post Harvey, uh, oversees billions of dollars uh, invested that the state makes in education, um, and also oversees the oil and gas uh, production on state lands, uh, in addition uh, to protecting private property when necessary, uh, when the federal government, um, for example, impedes on property rights. And this is the Red River ranchers and farmers dispute that he was uh, leading the charge against, along with other allies. Finally, he also oversaw uh, the preserving uh, of the Alamo. Our keynote interview, um, many of you will recognize Bob Garrett. Uh, he is the Austin Bureau Chief for the Dallas Morning News. And he has covered state government and politics at the news since 2002. And some of you may not know that he was a state house reporter for three newspapers, including the Dallas Times and Herald. He's a fifth generation Texan and got his degree at the park. I know that uh, Commissioner Bush got his law degree just down the street here at the Texas Law School, so tip of the hat to that uh, for the lawyers in the room that are long ones. And without further ado, I'll hand it over uh, to Mr. Garrett, and we look forward to a nice, robust discussion. Take it away. Can you hear me? Is it working? Thank you, Irene. Uh, Commissioner Well, um, We're going to have, I think, 30, 35 minutes, so we will try to leave. But I'm getting the press signal from Kelly. So we'll try to leave some room for questions in the audience. Um, nearly four years ago, Senator Jane Nelson, all of you before the Senate Finance Committee, I, I don't know if you have scar tissue from this one, but uh, it was a, talking about the Alamo Trust. And uh, for those of you who don't know, the Alamo Trust is an, uh, a, a, a subsidiary of the Alamo Endowment, and it's a nonprofit that unless something's changed since December 2017, um, held closed board meetings and wasn't subject to the Texas Public Information Act. At, at the time, senators said you should do voluntarily more to make public some information about this big public-private project involving the Alamo. Quote, keep it transparent. My folks want to understand what's happening here, Senator Joan Huffman. Republican of Houston told me. Now you're running to be the state's most powerful official on open records. Do you feel like private actors performing government functions should be subject to the TPIA? Well, thank you, Bob, for, I guess, my Thank you, Bob, for, there we go. Thank you, Bob, for uh, the question. Thank you for having me. I want to thank the foundation for welcoming me. Um, I'll also reiterate I'm the only candidate actually willing to spend the time with you because I think it's important. Uh, when you look at the AG's office, uh, 4,200 employees, 1,100 are devoted to this issue. So I think any serious candidate for this office needs to uh, not only be here, but build that relationship with the foundation. So Kelly, thank you for having me. Um, you're right. Uh, the Alamo, when I came into office, was totally uh, ignored. It was literally falling apart. And when I came into my first legislative session in 15, I focused on getting money to the Alamo. We went out and cast a very wide net to bring in a third-party manager. And lo and behold, nobody stepped forward to, to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the Alamo. We finally closed the deal in 2016. You may remember the uh, controversy with the Daughters of the Republic of Texas. We decided to go in a different direction. And the new group that we brought in was basically a, a committee of philanthropists in San Antonio, Houston, North Texas from around the state. And so in that legislative session, not only Jane Nelson, but Kirk Watson, the former state senator, um, recommended that we as an agency um, subject the agency not only to the Public Information Act, but to the Texas Open Records, or Texas Open Meeting Act as well. So back in 18, we went ahead and did that, and then in 19, we codified the 
public information act aspect. I, I kind of view this in two prongs. Um, but we went, in, went ahead and, and subjected ourselves to the Texas Open Meeting Act. So you can watch all of them. This is the Alamo Trust Incorporated, also known as ATI, that run the meetings quarterly. All the documents, all the emails, the texts, they're all uh, subject to, to public scrutiny. And this is, I think, um, important because as an executive head, um, I have that experience with the legislature to have that conversation. I want that conversation with you. Um, members of the foundation of the board to say whether it's ERCOT, whether it's Alamo, that we need to open the books. And so when you look at the winter storm, I think uh, the current attorney general was wrong in taking the interpretation that all of the correspondence, all of the emails, all the calls um, weren't disclosable. And I think he was wrong. I think he was. And I still think it's disgraceful. He hasn't disclosed anything for his luxury uh, ski trip in Utah while you and I were freezing our ass off uh, during that storm. What does he have to hide? The Utah Attorney General disclosed more documents than him. So, um, look, I, I think there's, and we'll have time to talk about this, but I have a lot of different ideas by which we can um, make government more transparent. But to answer your question, I think the court has weighed in at the highest level to say that if there is a substantial amount of taxpayer funds that go to an entity, even if it is considered a nonprofit, should be considered a full blown government for purposes of public information. Well, you anticipated a couple of my questions there, but the, uh, in March, nearly every major news outlet in Texas came together to publish a story about General Paxton's use or abuse of the Public Information Act, specifically, he's refusing to release any communications regarding his trip to D.C. on January 6th for the January 6th rally and some of the other trips you mentioned, one to Utah. Um, so you, you're emphatic that as Attorney General you would release even your uh, texts and emails wholesale, because he's wholesale rejecting the release of well, I, I think it's, it's critical that there be a mechanism created where the, aid, the AG is removed from the process as it relates to request of the AG's office, if that makes sense. Um, and I would be for a wholesale firewalling process because let's talk about one of the other incidents involving Ken Paxton, and that's the only time he went down to the Legal Services Division was to intervene to write a legal opinion on behalf of Nate Paul, his financial donor that hired his mistress. Um, you know, you got to remove the official, and that's what I've done at the land office with respect to um, contracts that are requested from um, our agencies to remove myself entirely from that decision-making process. So um, I think there's other ways in which we can work with the legislature to expedite the process for when those requests come in. Right now it's at 45 days. Why can't we, with modern-day technology, look at 30 days? Uh, why can't we look at, uh, I know there's a bill filed to this extent, but to increase the penalties by which people uh, refuse to release information um, and actually put teeth in the law to say that the Attorney General's office can either mediate, uh, as is the case in Florida or Georgia, um, or have that original right to prosecute uh, cases or governmental entities that refuse to release the information. A few years back, the state began redacting elected officials' home addresses from otherwise public documents, including the personal financial statements filed annually with the Ethics Commission. That's made the reporter's job harder um, in, in tracking just like simply whether legislators uh, actually live in the districts they represent. Um, would you support going back and taking that law back so that and I know this could be a subject close to home for you a few years ago, but I mean, would you support repealing that one? Uh, I'd have to take a look at the proposed language. Um, I just can't tell you that in the Alamo discussion, I know it draws laughs usually, but um, we did have threats. Uh, it was a very contentious uh, discussion and as elected officials and as a young family with two kids who are eight and six, I worry about their security. Um, I know in Travis County, for example, as a military veteran, you know, I, I would qualify for that redaction. Um, maybe there's a way in which, you know, we can look at, um, you know, for example, the lender that lends to the home or, or other ways to bring transparency to the process without disclosing. To be honest with you, as an elected official, we live in a world of doxing where 
sometimes once somebody gets a hold of your address, you can be um, you can be assaulted. So there's a balance. I'm open to that discussion um, and willing to visit with the author. And that's that's what I, I want to explain to each and every one of you as well. Is during the legislative process, I'm open to visiting with legislators um, on issues of the Information Act because I think it's uh, sensible for for open government. So there's ways in which we can get that information out, but not risk the personal safety of, of those in the old office. In the last regular legislative session, it seems like an eternity ago, but uh, it was just this year, uh, the current Attorney General proposed a bill that would flip the Open Records Act on its head. It would have allowed governmental entities to redact information they felt they should in the very first instance, uh, and then put the burden on the requester to seek an AG opinion to overturn those redactions. Um, and we've seen numerous examples of, of where this led to agencies just wholesale redacting documents for reasons like, quote, because it would be embarrassing, quote, to me. Um, if you're elected, you know, would you uh, ever propose a law like General Paxton did, like that? No, I think it's uh, trying to hit the easy button. Um, I, I think this shows a lack of management of what's happening under this law. Basically, the requests have tripled in the last four years um, in terms of requests to governmental entities. And so, since this is the charge, the statutory charge of the AG's office, as a manager, I would reinvest resources from other areas of the agency or ask for supplemental uh, support from the legislature to meet those needs by hiring more uh, folks, whether they're full-time employees and or attorneys to review the opinions and to expedite the process and meet the speed of business. Because the speed of government is not keeping pace and the speed of this particular area within the AG's office is, is not meeting the needs of what the public's right is to know uh, on, on issues. So he hasn't raised the budget. He hasn't raised any FTEs in this area of the agency. And because of the broken relationship that he has with the legislature for anybody who followed um, his scorecard, so to speak, from the LDB, you'll see that they'll never trust him again. So we need a new attorney general that can rebuild that trust, invest the necessary resources so that we can expedite the request quicker for news agencies and for the broader public. Well, I'm not gonna get into the Google antitrust case, but the, uh, you've raised the question of sort of a horse and buggy, antiquated approach, uh, not having the personnel and not using electronic uh, means. You're, you're, I'm sure, well aware of uh, the current Attorney General's policy concerning the skeleton crew and how during the COVID pandemic it's been abused. Um, so basically, that allows agencies to just uh, indefinitely not follow those deadlines for responding, and uh, that's delayed journalists and the public from getting records they're entitled to receive. So, do you think we uh, have the technology to allow remotely working employees to uh, gather and, and fulfill the records request? Absolutely. You know, we uh, are an agency, we have 800 full-time employees, and we transitioned within a month. And so, you know, the, I believe that uh, the laws, this component, or the legal opinion was based upon the assumption that we would only have tornadoes, hurricanes, and natural disasters in Texas. Didn't contemplate pandemic. And I think a lot of us, would agree perhaps a grace period of a week, and I think that was a proposal from the ledge to give agencies to toll the clock, so to speak, before the clock starts again on, on getting documents out. Um, but we moved and we continue to operate remotely. So I disagree with the AG's legal opinion there. Um, I think it's been abused by other state agencies. Um, our agency, just to be totally transparent, for about four months um, did the same thing until I found out about it in the staff meeting and I said, I don't care what, what the AG's legal opinion is on this issue, it's not the right thing to do. The public deserves the right to know when they're asking about elderly care facilities, namely the aid that we manage for military veterans. And so it was El Paso and I think the Chronicle that were reporting on that and we reached out and provided those documents. And now in real time, we're providing up-to-date information on the elderly care facilities that we manage. And Senator Zafarini passed a bill um, that I think is the right thing to do to not violate the HIPAA. Let's preserve the privacy information of those um, in their healthcare um, documents. But in terms of the locations and the amount of cases, 
that that should be known to the public and to community members that have family members in these facilities. So uh, I call upon other agencies to ignore this rule as AG, I would work with the legislator to codify that, to define um, for purposes of the Public Information Act, um, days to not include Saturday, Sunday, and state holidays. And I think we can put this behind us. That's good because that, uh, you know one of the few bills, uh, transparency bills that passed uh, did uh, allow catastrophe notices, which kind of takes care of the problem for, from the agency side. Um, well, you mentioned winter storm, Yuri. Um, your thoughts are that the PUC should have had to disclose everything? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I like, um, and I'll have to get the citation to the court case. Um, and when it was in connection to um, another nonprofit, the Greater Houston Partnership, which some of you from Houston may be familiar with, which does receive substantial funding both from the federal government and state government. And they took a position in court that they weren't required to disclose um, some of their internal deliberations. And, um, and so that was brought to the court. The court ruled that um, using a substantial interest test, that if a public entity is funding, that um, there should be a requirement. So I, I think Burcock clearly, they took the defense along with A.G. Paxton and his legal opinion that since the PUC is essentially has oversight over ERCOT, and that ERCOT is a nonprofit entity that they're not required to disclose. But if there's an incident from uh, this past year that uh, concerns Texans when I visit throughout the state, it's uh, the state's response to this. And the only way to get to that is to understand what went wrong. Um, you know, and so I think considering the legislature really didn't move the ball a lot on the issue, this may have something to do with it because they weren't required to disclose internal emails, texts, um, and, and other documents. And so, um, so I would be for that witness test in terms of evaluating. In the interest of time, I was going to give you the parade of horribles from a reporter at the San Antonio Express News, Joshua Fector, who's now moved to the Texas Tribune. But uh, I will, I'll spare the audience that. But a shocking degree of just flat out non response to open records requests uh, from all levels of government, local, and state. I believe you said earlier that this would support some kind of penalties. Uh, and there have been bills about that. Now, when we say penalties, we're not necessarily putting these people in jail. It's things like training. Uh, but I mean, you're, you're definitely supporting that. We can get you on record. Yeah, so the, uh, the, I believe the statute does allow for a fine of up to $5,000 and half a year in jail. Um, you know, perhaps you revisit that and, and put some teeth behind that in addition to just training. Um, because that's the only way that people are gonna get serious about it is, is to put uh, additional liability. Let me ask you an education-related question. Are you aware that uh, under the Open Records Act, charter schools uh, are treated differently from public schools and, and school districts? Uh, that oftentimes, charter schools are not subject to the act, uh, increasing concerns that sweetheart deals may be going on there undetected. Uh, would you take a look at that? I would take a look at it. Uh, I'm a big advocate for for public charters, and, and one of the reasons why is, you know, we're for um, an equal playing field and, and uh, being evaluated based upon the same criteria, and that standard should apply to, uh, to information. So I, I haven't followed that, honestly, the issue um, as detailed as I should, but I'd love to visit with the foundation and, and uh, maybe have a round table with uh, the charter school board. One of the... Uh Growing problems is redactions of birth dates from public records. Um, in 2015, there was a, a regional state court of appeal ruling that is leading to thousands of redactions of birth dates. Uh, the practice is not uniform statewide, uh, and we would, uh, in the news industry, industry we use birth dates for simple things like vetting candidates, but also making sure. We're naming the correct person and stories, uh, but but it's not just a special interest concern of news media. Many industries need these to properly vet prospective job applicants. And uh, do you support continued access by the public to these the DOBs and these kinds of public records? 
Uh, again, that's a, another issue I'm not as uh, briefed on, to be honest with you, and I, I feel uh, I don't want to come into a position right now. I, I am mindful of fraud, and that is another charge of the, of the agencies, making sure that we're protecting um, people's information as well. So um, cybersecurity being one of them on behalf of the state. So I, I don't want to commit to a position at this time. Let's talk about law enforcement a little bit. The um, police records, such as narratives, videos, and other documents uh, are withheld when a um, charge doesn't result in a conviction or deferred adjudication. But this has led to uh, a perverse uh, interpretation about such documents, videos, uh, involving defendants who have died, and there was a high, high profile case, the Graham Dyer case, of uh, uh, in the Mesquite Jail, he was tased, uh, he had various issues, uh, and was substance abusing the night uh, of his arrest, but his mother was unable to get through the Texas Public Information Act uh, records that she used the Freedom of Information Act, the Federal Act, and got the videos that showed uh, abuse, of, uh, police abuse, while he was in custody pre preceding his death. And should we uh, continue to let police departments hide records uh, when someone dies in their custody? Well, I, uh, this, this is a tough case, um, one that, um, you know, w was big news in, in the Metroplex and, um, you know, I, I can't really take a side on this one because, um, you know, as the parent of two boys, again, I can't as a parent uh, imagine a, a situation like Mr. Dwyer encountered. Um, I do think law enforcement have the right to basically adjudicate their personnel decisions internally and uh, the public should be, I think, shielded from that process while they determine the discipline, while they determine um, whether or not to terminate, um, and to keep that out of the public eye because we live in a society now where the inflammatory aspect of showing video um, is it's prejudicing juries, it's making law enforcement jobs uh, more, more challenging. Um, I do support the, the right to know, and in this case, there was the federal right that allowed them through their civil rights case to get the uh, additional information. Uh, I know Representative Moody filed the bill and uh, would like to visit with him on the details of instances where maybe there's a closed audience or a closed viewing of a family member. Like for example, in the situations we dealt with with elderly care facilities, the media would sometimes criticize us for not releasing uh, HIPAA covered uh, healthcare information um, to relatives, but we would remind them that only folks with a statutory power of attorney uh, or a direct relative, one step above and one step below, we could show uh, information too. So there's ways to work together to try to meet the end game without uh, jeopardizing the, uh, the consequential result that could really inflame a really difficult situation. I have a few politics questions, but I wanted to open up to the audience any, um, any questions furthering this topic of transparency. Uh, I know Lauren, my colleague Lauren McGuire, he may have a question. And I like the mask. Yeah. Isn't that a good one? Just give you the microphone. Thanks, sorry. I didn't mean to grab this from anyone else that has a question, but I have a very quick one. Do you think that the Attorney General himself should be subject to the Texas Whistleblower Act? Totally. Uh, I think it's the most asinine legal argument I've seen in a long time, where in appeals court he claimed that uh, as an elected official, we're not public officials because he's elected. And uh, that totally defies the spirit of what the law is intended. It's intended to protect employees that suspect crimes being committed by their superiors. It's the whole purpose of the Whistleblower Act, not only at the state level, but the federal level. And so. He claims he's not subject to the suit that's being brought by eight of his top lieutenants. And these weren't, you know, uh, career officials that have a grudge against him. These were his folks that he brought into the agency. So um, it, I don't suspect it. In fact, I think one of the reporters commented in the headline were that the uh, appellate court was skeptical of uh, the argument. I, I would be very skeptical myself. And um, it, it's just a shame we shouldn't have a top lawyer, regardless of your viewpoints. Um, in, in question and in doubt, and we need to protect those that witness crime 
and bring that to the public. Commissioner, this is Laura Prather. She's on the board of the Freedom of Information Foundation, but she's also the live attorney for the Dallas Morning News. So. Thank you for being here, first of all. Um, I wanted to follow up on your answer with regard to the in-custody death issue, and maybe just help you reframe um, your outlook on this, because I understand the need to have family members have that closure, and certainly Kathy Dyer and others have testified in very compelling and gut-wrenching ways before the legislature about that need for closure. But the problem is that leaves out the public, and what we have is a problem of public accountability of law enforcement officials. And so if that investigation, if that internal investigation of law enforcement is completed, at that point in time, would you be in favor of not leaving the discretion with law enforcement and allowing the public to have the information so that they can have further trust in their law enforcement? To, to the extent that there is a plaintiff out there that can demonstrate the right to know and can essentially have a, a due process right following the internal investigation. Um, but again, I want to be able to examine the full um, picture of what's available to somebody, whether it's say the media or somebody in the community to, to find that. Um, and again, look at the federal options that are available to any citizen. Um, so again, I, I don't want to commit to anything here. I want to dive into each case. I want to fire my, I'll fire well myself from legal opinion drafting from staff. And, but I want my staff to investigate every single case and give it the credit and the diligence that it deserves instead of just kind of rubber standing opinions. Thank you. Anyone else? Got one back here. Uh, let's start with you. Uh, Commissioner, um, John Bustian here. Uh, your wife, Amanda, is a lawyer who spent... Uh, it's a cross-examination. Kind of. <laughs> You'll see where I'm going. Uh, who spent a career advocating First Amendment rights and the right to know. Has her involvement in those issues impacted your view of the world? Um, I guess uh, put me on the spot here, John. Uh, my wife uh, was an attorney at Jackson Walker for many years, uh, represented news publications throughout uh, not only Texas but the country. And yeah, I mean, she, uh, it, it's interesting for her because now she's married to a public official. So uh, my libel. Slander law is pretty weak, but if I recall correctly, there's a pretty wide gap there between elected officials and private citizens. Um, now, she, um, let me just put it this way. She, you, you all have an advocate in the end of Bush House. Um, she built great relationships and argued many cases uh, on these issues and I think saved a lot of publications here, a lot of money. Um, so, um, no, it, she's just a great mom to our boys and, um, but also, you know, brings a different perspective on issues. Everyone here? Hello. 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 Uh, Commissioner, what would you do to expand the investi investigative uh, abilities of the Office of the Attorney General, kind of a background, to file public information requests to several legislative offices requesting um, information call logs from them, and previously they had provided information, but then decided in, in future requests not to provide them. I received uh, information from the Office of the Attorney General where they said they do not have the ability to go down and investigate uh, when an office is refusing to release that information that they already have. What would you do to kind of expand that, your ability? Sure. So one of the statutory um, changes that we're proposing in this campaign is to look at Florida and Georgia, where their AG has a broader um, capability to not only investigate um, in areas of criminal law, but to follow on with respect to Information Act um, cases, because uh, you're right, with um, what we have heard just over there is that uh, they're not keeping pace with um, not only just information requests, but also requests for investigation following through, um, and including victims. We haven't talked about criminal victims. and. We, we are kind of the clearinghouse for, for that as well. So there just needs to be a re-examination of uh, how this is viewed as a customer service. That's how I try to run the land office with, uh, and visiting with staff is to run this really, you know, at the outset, uh, as you all talked about, that 
we are not the boss, you are the boss, or at least the public is. And so um, re-examining how we can put the resources into that so that we can be more responsive. Thank you, Commissioner. Especially on the legislature, anything involving the legislature. Anybody over here? Commissioner Bush, the AG's office for a long time, for many decades, has played a really central role under the, the statute, it's literally the clearinghouse to whether or not governmental entities can validly assert an exception and withhold documents. And in my view, one of the reasons that it is saddled so much work and has dedicated so many resources to it is that there's no other alternative for requesters to seek a ruling on their objection from the government and just get their records. Um, would you be in favor of looking at other means for requesters to seek enforcement of their requests versus only kind of relegating themselves to waiting on the bureaucratic processes and the AG issuing an opinion for literally every single objection that's invoked to a document request? So alternatives to enforcement outside of the AG's office. Um. We'd be, we'd be interested in looking at any and all measures to, to make this uh, more of an expedited process. Um, and you touched on one issue that I haven't addressed, and that's the exceptions. Because there are now 60 exceptions to not disclose under the Information Act. That probably needs to be re-examined as well. Um, the current guy has used the attorney-client privilege for his own activities for just about any communication he's made. Um, so kind of reining in not only the size and scope of that exemption, but um, but having a different enforceability mechanism. And so, again, we've been talking with other AGs uh, in other states, and uh, again, adding more teeth to the process, um, providing an alternative other than just, say, the AGs, if we're not moving quickly enough for you, um, we'd be open to that discussion, and that's gonna require work with the legislature to craft that, too. Commissioner, thank you. Thank you, and I'm gonna turn this back over to Arif.